Well, welcome to the March edition of the Little Cats Red Cap Hour. Glad you all could make it. Uh, I hope you'll uh, enjoy today's presentation. I've got a surprise. Today's Red Cap Hour is presented by Cyber Infrastructure Enhancement and the Biostatistics and Epidemiology Corps. Uh, and with us today, whoops, sorry everyone, we're having some monitor problems. Good, okay. Uh, who are we? I'm David Alexander, Core Director for Cyber Infrastructure Enhancement. I've got Daniel Lorio with RedCap Administrator. And our special guest is uh, Rari Bio with uh, Biostats and Epicore. Fantastic. So, uh, Good. Uh, I'll just I'll just do what I normally do and ask uh, that uh, if you could take a minute after the presentation today to visit thecats.org slash redcap feedback. We'd love to get your feedback or you can email us at redcap at lecats.org. We'll have that email address later. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback, ideas you'd like to uh, you'd like us to cover. Uh, nothing's too big, nothing's too small. We'd love to tackle it. Um, so again, I'll put this up at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and uh, and now I'm just going to step out the way and hand it over to Daniel and Robbie uh, for data validity, double data entry, and outlier detection. So, so, all right. So double data entry. This is the process where you have two data entry clerks. And you will want to get them to enter the same record each uh, each time. So they'll enter maybe like the demographics. Each one will enter the same record, and uh, hopefully they'll they'll all each uh, field inside that record will match up. And then uh, you uh, the record reviewer can review it and then say that this is correct. You know, it basically helps you control your data and the validity of uh, of each record. How do you want See how do you enter it? I mean, how do you enable it? Uh, so you'll need at least three uh, person persons that have uh, that can be assigned to three different roles. They'll have a data entry number one, a data entry number two, and a record reviewer, which is somebody that will look over everything and uh, make sure that uh, everything matches. And number two, you also need to contact your RedCap administrator. The double data entry module is, is project specific and is also disabled by default. So uh, RedCap administrator will have to enable it for your specific record. So is this, is this standard within RedCap? Or have we enabled something to allow it? It's, it's standard in, in RedCap. It's just standard and default disabled. So most people kind of over uh, like miss this feature. Gotcha. All right. So. After you enable the module, in the user rights uh, page, you're able to assign each user to, or group of users to the respective role. You, and those roles are, as mentioned before, reviewer. And in the image you can see is person one and person two, which refer to data entry one and re, uh, data entry number two. Okay. and. Right here, I show a side-by-side -side, uh, entry from data entry number one and number uh, data entry number two. They both both view the record as as one uh, as one record. So they're going to see uh, a record named D1001 for both data entry number one and data entry number two. However, the record reviewer sees it as two different records. It's going to be the same record number followed by a number one or number two, uh, defining on which uh, which data entry person had entered the record. Okay. And here, I uh, for some odd reason my notes are messed up, but anyway, here uh, the data. Uh, I've introduced two errors in here to uh, so that you can actually view it later on. But first name for data entry number two, there's an extra M on there, and the date of birth for uh, the first data entry clerk is off by one uh, digit. And uh, so the record reviewer will be able to go through it and uh, and 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 check for the differences. 
So as you can see on the left-hand side, um, you'll see this is what the record reviewer sees. You'll see both records uh, followed by one and then followed by two for both data entry one and then data entry two record. Uh, from this point, uh, the record reviewer will want to merge the two records into one by comparing the differences. There's a data comparison tool inside RecCap where the, the record reviewer can select the record and then RecCap will automatically compare the re that record and see if there's any differences between the two. If there are any records, uh, if there are any differences in between the records, the uh, RecCap will display the records and let you choose between the two fields. So in the left-hand side, you'll see uh, the record ID uh, from data entry one and also data entry number two. The first name is uh, for John is uh, for record uh, data entry number one. It looks good, but data entry two has the extra M on there for John. So that's a typo. So and then number two, the date of birth, that also doesn't uh, match. So record reviewer will have to decide uh, probably by going back and review the record information and then correct it from there. So this is a screen um, that you get when you try to merge the two records. For those that are different, uh, you can select which one's correct, uh, as you can see from the image on the right. So I selected John on the, on the left-hand side from data entry one, and I, I found that data entry number two was correct with the year of 1982. So I selected that. If neither the, neither the one of those were correct, I could actually select the third option, was it, which is a new value. And I can uh, select and I can enter that as the new value and then merge the record as a third new record, uh, which is a new record for that. If, the, if all the uh, information inside that record was identical, it will just simply ask you if you want to merge the records. It won't show any differences. So this is what it looks like after merging. So you still have the data entry number one and number two records uh, below. So that, that's D1001-1 and 1001-2, those, those two from data entry. And the record reviewer created the third one, which is D1001, which is the record that has been merged. This information can be actually, oops, sorry. <laughs> How can I go back? But anyway, uh, that after, after you collected all your information and merged all your records, you can basically uh, do data cleaning afterwards after you're done with the study, which I guess Robbie Beal would be able to help out with. So, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Robbie. Oh, if y'all have, if they have any questions or. Um, actually, I have. Yeah, are there any, uh, are there any questions from the group? I see we had another another couple of people join. Anne's typing a, a message. Oh, okay. She says no questions. Thanks. That was great. Okay, I do I do want to mention one thing though. Um, I forgot to mention earlier. There, it's uh, not especially good when you're doing repeating instruments because. I don't think it's programmed into that right now, mm -hmm. or if it's ever going to be, because if you have repeating instruments, it's kind of difficult to tell which one was entered first, second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, if that's enabled into your project. Just keep that in mind. And also, there was one comment about the uh, sur surveys. If, uh, if you have any instruments that are surveys that are entered by the participant for double data entry uh, things. so. I would, I would guess that that'd be okay, but it might cause confusion. Uh, but you could uh, just, I, I believe you would be able to accept that as, as the merge record or not. I'm, I'm not sure though. I haven't, haven't been able to play around with that. So. I like the, the fact that they're, they're preserved, that the values are preserved, both both sets and yeah, the yeah. merge product. That's that's nice that that's built down. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a question. Uh, so you showed that uh, the final, you have three final records. The data from data entry one, the data from data entry two, and the merged record. Correct. Can I just export the merged only, or do I have to export everybody and then subset it? I haven't been able to play with that. I looked at that, I quickly glanced at that, 
and it didn't seem right away apparent. So there might be a way to do that, but I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. So uh, from a statistics perspective, uh, we can easily subset the data set based on the merge because the names are going to be different. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, that may be something we want to look into instead yeah. of given three times as much data, we can cut yeah, it in half and create the small data set. But it's not a uh, anywhere of a problem because we can easily, win in, during the analysis stage, adjust for that. Mm -hmm. Great, that's a great question. Awesome. Very good. Sure. Thank you. All right, so uh, now that we've talked about double data entry, we're kind of uh, going to take a step forward and back and just talk about outliers in general. So double data entry is a way to get around potential outliers. So we're going to kind of just briefly go into what are outliers, what are we doing, and then uh, what's going on with them. So in general, an outlier is simply a value that's not like um, the others. So a very Sesame Street, you know, one of these things is not like the others. Um, so uh, you can see that the plot on the right there, we can see that most of these values uh, follow some kind of linear trend over time. But there's one value in that top left corner that's different. Um, so uh, let me begin by saying that outliers are not necessarily incorrect. They're just different from the other ones. So um, this value is unusual, and we want to highlight this value and then talk about it. So again, these may be something like a high lab value. Uh, you may have an unusual weight change, um, something like a BMI that's un uh, unusual. Again, not uh, incorrect, because we, uh, we may be doing a study where we're looking at all ranges of BMI and we get someone coming in with a BMI of 15, and everyone else has a BMI of 30. So again, that BMI is possible, but again, it looks a little different than the rest. Uh, another important idea about outliers is that um, they're different than noise. So again, if we look at that plot right there, we see that we have the red line kind of trending overall what's happening. We don't expect all the dots to fall on the red line. We expect them to fall somewhere around that red line, somewhere above, up, above it, somewhere below it. Uh, However, we see that one, again, that one observation is uh, highly above it. So that's what we call an outlier. It wouldn't necessarily be that the dots didn't exactly fall on the line, but which ones are the furthest from the line? Or are they really that different? Okay. So you have basically two types of outliers. You have global outlier and you have uh, special outliers or local outliers. So again, if we look at this picture on the right, we see that we have really three uh, bunchings of data. We have the uh, top right corner that's fully spread out. Uh, we have the bottom left corner that's all very compact. And then we have that one observation in the uh, lower right uh, corner that's different. So the question is, again, I didn't put axes on this one, but are any of these observations outliers? Well, we have to think about it as a whole. So, as a whole, um, perhaps uh, none of these would quantify as outliers because they're spread out over the place. Or maybe that, um, and I've noted it as um, O1, maybe that O1 is outlier because it's not in that small group on the left or that spread out group uh, in the top right. Uh, also, again, um, that's the kind of difference between global outliers uh, where we think some are different versus specialty outliers. And an example of a specialty outlier is that O2 mark. So if we are just looking in that smaller subsect on the uh, bottom left, we see that everything's grouped together, but that O2 is kind of apart from the rest. Now, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that different, but it does look different than that subset. So those are things we want to think about, whether we want to talk about global outliers or more local outliers. And again, I'll go into detail about this a little more. Uh, again, the global outliers are um, easy to identify. So they're going to be the one observation that's going to be different from the rest. So no matter how you break the data up, you have this one observation that's different. So that's the easy one. The harder one is the, um, is the local outlier or the more specialized outlier. 
So if you look at that picture on the bottom uh, right corner, we see that we have a spread of dots everywhere. Now if you just ask dots in general, ignoring the color, did you see any outliers? Your answer would probably be no. They're kind of spread out everywhere. They're clumped sometimes a little more in one area, but they're spread out. However, if I said the um, filled in dots were one group and the uh, non-filled in dots were another group, uh, we may say that uh, filled in dot in the top uh, right corner is different. All the other ones are grouped up together, kind of, and that one is out to the side. So maybe that is an outlier. So globally, that um, black dot in the top right corner may not be an outlier, but locally it could be. And these are things we, again, we have to think about when we discuss outliers. Are we talking global? Are we talking local? Do we want to even get into local level? Are we just interested in the global? So I believe, um, again, we're going to talk about causes of outliers. So uh, the first cause of outliers is poor data quality. And hopefully with double data entry like Daniel covered, we can get away from this poor data quality. Uh, by having someone enter the data twice, we make sure that the BMI of 30 uh, uh, is real and we don't have a BMI of 300 where someone, again, incorrectly entered the data. We would correct that. Um, another potential cause of outliers is low quality in uh, the measurements we're taking. Uh, again, if we don't have good instrumentation, uh, if we have a scale that's in, uh, functioning improperly, it can uh, give us wide variation and then give us all these outliers. Uh, and again, always the outlier is not necessarily incorrect. It could be some exceptional data. We could have a person with a BMI of 15 and because we didn't restrict the study originally to be 30 plus, we just had that. That is correct. Uh, so as a statistician, we try to turn, uh, we try to blindly look at the data. We don't care if it's correct or not. We just want to say these values are unusual. And then we leave it to the researcher to say, is this correct or should it be removed or edited in some way? Okay. Uh, so detection of outliers. So, so now this is getting more into the statistical, what are we going to do about outliers? We've talked about them, but how are we going to do it? Um, so, <clears throat> Again, we have to consider uh, not the uh, individual, but the uh, groups of objects. So again, is this one point different? Is this one subject different? Or is this different than the whole of the data set? Um, it's important to have a working knowledge of the relationships. So if I'm looking at weight over time, maybe I measure weight 80 times. And it's important for me to take into account the subject starting weight to look for outlier. I, we can do that. Maybe it's not. Maybe it shouldn't matter what their starting, uh, maybe let's say white blood cell count is. It should be all the same. So it should be irregardless of the uh, subject. So then we'll, we won't take that into account. So there are, uh, again, multiple types of outliers we need to look at. And then we can have an outlier on more than one level. Maybe it's a uh, global outlier and a uh, local outlier or vice versa. So I want to quickly look over some um, visualization guides that I like to use for outliers. Now the first one is uh, simply a box and whisker plot. Uh, we just get overall means, some uh, interquartile ranges, they're based on the data, and then we uh, graph what's in those ranges. So see, uh, we can see that in sample 22, we don't have any outliers. So that is spread out, um, uh, let's say, evenly. In sample 3, we do have an outlier. We see that it's marked um, with a colored X above in red and below in pink. So these are values that are a little unusual, maybe higher than what we're going to call the interquartile range. Now, again, I don't want to get into what is interquartile range, how should I calculate it. Just these are good ideas of how should we look for outliers? So in here, I would say all these outliers. Now, if we look in sample four, we do see there's a outlier below um, the level in pink. However, is that unusual globally? 
No, we see that again, that value is about uh, 40, and we see other values hit that and not call outliers. So that would be more of a maybe a local outlier as opposed to a global outlier. So an example of a global outlier in this setting would be uh, sample five, again, looking below at the pink, that number, which is again, maybe five or six, is very different from the others. So perhaps that one is incorrect. Uh, so that's an example of a global outlier. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite methods to use is individual re uh, residual plots. So um, here we're looking at wattage from a subject over time. Uh, they were doing some exercise. Uh, the blue bands are, we took all the data, we got some confidence intervals, and we say, we think 95% of the time you should be within this band. Uh, and then we have the means plotted over time, and again, that band. Uh, however, the uh, blue line that we're seeing um, is one particular subject's characteristics. So we see at first they do start within the blue line. Uh, the average at the start is about 150. We see that slightly above it. Uh, but then afterwards they jump out. So here's an example of when they started at the same time, but then their values are much lower for the follow-up than the rest. So uh, again, not that this data is incorrect, but this is unusual. This is an outlier. Why did they start within and then jump so far below? And also, what is the outlier? Because I, I pulled the subject, but really the outlier point is that point is that red dot at the very first time point. It's unusual compared to the rest of this subject because again, it's starting at like 160, where the rest of the subject values are all below 50. So this is a really interesting case where we're saying the outlier is the one that's actually closest to the overall mean because the rest of their data is different. So um, again, this goes into, is it a global outlier? No, no one would ever say that's a global outlier. But locally for that subject, that's an outlier. So why are they jo uh, dropping so low? Uh, so this is something that we would point out to the researcher. We're not trying to say that, um, any of these values are incorrect. We're just saying this is unusual. So perhaps a more typical case would be uh, something like this, where again, we're gonna be monitoring weight uh, every day for about 50 days. We can see that the weight changes a little bit over time, but uh, for a certain day, uh, it really pops up. And we say, well, that's a little unusual. Why did they gain so much weight on that one day and then lose it the next? Could it be a bad data entry? Could it be they just, you know, went to a buffet and ate a lot of food and then lost a lot of food? Uh, so that could be something we could look at. So again, not that this data point is wrong that's highlighted in red. We just think that that's unusual based on their other weight changes that that shouldn't happen. Okay. Um, as far as methods for detecting these, I kind of showed you the residual plots and then the Boston Whisker. We can do other things by looking at the distribution, residual score, Cook's D. Again, I don't want to get into that, but we have to think about the distribution of the data itself. So I've shown three distributions pretty quickly. The left one is showing uh, a normal distribution, a bell-shaped curve. So it's easy to detect outliers. So it's going to be the ones that are uh, outside of plus or minus three standard deviations. Uh, However, it gets a little more tricky when we have what's called skewed data. So skewed data is the uh, middle and right plot. So if we look at the middle plot, we see it's skewed one way. It's pushed more to the left than in the middle. So what is an outlier there? So we can see that um, we have one maybe observation at 25. Is that really an outlier? Because it is different from the rest, or is this more a function of the data itself? it's gonna have more of an exponential curve where it's just gonna continue to go down over time. Uh, so another example of that is uh, the other skewed when we look at it, it's uh, increasing over time. So is that unusual? So we, uh, statisticians will take this into account to uh, about the nature of the distribution of the data rather than just saying 25 is an outlier because it's different from the rest. So I wanted at the end to kind of go over how you would handle outliers. So this is my quick six step process. 
I usually like to, uh, you know, speak with statistics in the first saying, let's check for outliers. Uh, when possible, uh, you want to give them bounds to say, why well, I think weight should be between 150 and 300. Now, again, you don't have to give them bounds, but that gives them a good idea of something to start with to say, you have so many unusual values. Uh, the next point I like to go into is have the statistician determine a list of potential outliers. So like we talked about before, I have this value that um, is different subject-wise, but overall maybe it's not different. Uh, so the statistician should be able to produce a list of potential outliers. From there, uh, we like to have the researcher maybe look over the list, go to the primary source of data, make sure the re data is um, recorded correctly from the original records. A lot of the um, problems we have is uh, sometimes we'll have paper records that will be transferred to electronic means and someone entered it incorrectly. If we had double data entry, then we would have had this problem solved, but uh, maybe we didn't. Um, so then look at that. that. Uh, if we do decide to remove some outliers, I, th I like to have a rationale why we're removing it. I don't want to remove it just because it's greater than three times the same deviations. I want to say that this is not part of the population. We're not interested in people below a BMI of 25, let's say. We need to have some good reasonings why. And also, if we do remove it, I want to know, um, uh, should we remove it from just this data set or from all future analysis as well? Uh, a, a big thing in the NI today is reproducibility. So uh, if we talk about removing outliers, I want to make sure we remove, remove it from uh, all the distribution, let's say, or we need to write in the, let's say, article we're writing why we remove certain objects this time, but not other times. So again, have rationale and then decide whether we want to completely remove it because it's maybe incorrect or just remove it this time because at this time, maybe we're only listed, interested in looking at people of a certain BMI range. So that's all I have. I just want to do a quick plug for the uh, Biostats and EpiCore webpage. We have a, some tutorials on there, some um, slideshows about some other things, power analysis and whatnot. So uh, we're always happy to have you click on there and look through those. So now I'll open the floor to any questions anyone may have. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say that I thought this was really helpful. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm just checking in to see if we have any in the chat section. Yeah, so um, I'll just uh, say a quick comment. Um, as far as feedback goes, I gave, you know, a, a 30,000 foot view of outliers. If, we enter it, if people are interested in more detail, we can go into that, or we can just skim over topics. Um, Again, the feedback is helpful to know what people want. So uh, definitely um, let me know whether you want more detail or less detail. Um, again, I just find that the overview is always easier to talk about at first, but, and, but future calls, we can go into more detail. Great. Great. Great, just another thank you on the board. So no, no questions via chat. Um, fantastic. Well. Well, I want to thank you, Robbie, for this. This has been great. And Daniel as well. Fantastic today. Uh, I'll, I'll just put in a few of my uh, my mandatory uh, plugs here. <laughs> if you have any general questions about REDCap at any time, not just on during the, the REDCap hour, please send them along to redcap at lecats.org. Uh, we're happy to answer those at any time. Uh, and uh, and then I mentioned at the beginning the, the REDCap feedback survey. Uh, we'd love to have you... Submit one of those. Um, if, you, if there's specific content you'd like to see, uh, here's a link to some REDCap training resources that we, we have on there. And then uh, if you don't have a REDCap instance and you'd like to try one out, this is a place to get a one-week uh, free demo uh, hosted by Vanderbilt, redcapdemo.vanderbilt.edu. So, uh, and I think that's everything we have for today. Yeah. So if there's no questions uh, in the audience, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up for today. And I'd like to thank you for joining, and uh, and we will see you again in April. Great.
Thanks. Thanks, everyone.